Turn to the book of Genesis again as we conclude our study on Joseph today, Lord willing, and how appropriate that song, God Knows Better Than We Do. Aren't you thankful for that? If it were you and me, we'd choose the easy, short-sighted, very kind of low-aim kind of way of living, and that God has greater plans for us, and I hope through our study here on Sunday mornings, God has elevated your view to see God's plan as being greater and more glorious than the best case scenario you could contrive in your own effort. Genesis, if you would, chapter 41, let's begin in verse 53, and we'll read a few verses together and then ask the Lord to help us this morning. Did I give you a different chapter to begin with? Or is that what I said? All right, Genesis 41. I just saw some of you flip when I just said Genesis. Four. Genesis something, turn there and then go to 41. <laughs> and we're going to look at verse 53. Genesis 41, and let's begin in verse 53. And the seven years of plenteous that, were, that was in the land of Egypt were ended, and the seven years of dearth began to come according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. Notice now verse 55. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to you, do. This morning I want to answer this question as we finish our study. How do I persevere? How do you persevere and how do we help others do the same thing? Let's pray and ask God to help us today. Father, thank you for the joy it is to be in this setting today. Lord, how our hearts have been stirred and encouraged and challenged through music and fellowship already today. And Fathers, we now gather around your word and seek to put the capstone, if you will, upon this series and upon this study that God is looking at, Joseph, the Prince of Perseverance. Pray, God, we would not just say that's Joseph's thing, but God, with your help, we might say this is our thing. This is your will for us. And God, whatever we face this morning, you are greater, you are more glorious and powerful than anything, God, that seeks to overwhelm us this morning. And I pray today we would fix our eyes upon you, and God, we would persevere until you give relief, until you bring reconciliation. May we be found faithful. Bless our study this morning, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I, one of the things that comes to my mind when I think of perseverance is you young mothers especially. Um, how many of you men, if you're honest this morning, when you drive out of your, when you back out of your driveway to go to work, you thank God that you're not the mom of that house. Have any of you honestly done that? All right, a few of you brave souls. The rest of you men, come on, be honest, we're in church, all right? I've done it. And in knowing what's ahead of that day, maybe it's some sort of discipline or training. I can think of a few stages already in our home where I am thankful my wife is the, quote, hands-on presence in our home, if you know what I mean. I saw the other day a picture, uh, and it, it was a picture of a baby, and it was nicely done, but it was hilarious. It was a picture of a baby, and somehow they had, with duct tape, they had stuck the baby to a refrigerator. And, and beside the picture, it had this heading. It said this, when all else fails, get out the duct tape and stick them to the fridge. And what was funny was not just the picture of the baby and then the, the slogan, beside Junior is his stuffed duck also taped to the refrigerator. I don't know if you ever struggle with persevering in a way that honors and pleases the Lord. Uh, I find in life, the longer I go, because of the world in which I live and in which you live, it's easy to start, isn't it? It's easy to get something going, but just by attrition, just by living in this world with all of its dysfunction, there's a tendency to fade, to falter, instead of sticking out what God has laid upon our hearts. Many of us this morning, we know God's will, and we've started it. The question I have for you this morning is, how do we finish it? How do we persevere in that relationship? How do we persevere in that responsibility? How do we persevere in that hardship, that chronic situation? How do we finish in a way that pleases the Lord? Now, in our story this morning, we find Joseph. I cannot overemphasize what a crisis was before this young man. Now, is he dealing with his family that we talked about a few weeks ago? Now he's dealing with the calamity, the crisis of worldwide famine. Can you picture this morning, day after day, of endless blue skies, searing sun, cattle falling, crops caving in, and all around them is famine. And I find it fascinating that when the people came to Pharaoh, 
Who did he direct their attention toward? And who did he direct their ears toward? This young man, Joseph, that God was preparing to use in a great way. The question this morning is, how do we become a divinely positioned leader of per- perseverance in the face of cri- crisis? How do we become that in our families, in our ministry, and in our community? What I want to look at today, as you'll see on your uh, bulletin, is two responses that we should have to difficulty. That if we have those two responses, God can help us to please and honor the Lord in the face of crisis. Number one, if you're taking notes this morning, would you jot down number one? First of all, we need a calm plan. We need a calm plan. There's a great poem, and I would encourage you, if you've never read it, just maybe after church today when you're meditating upon how God has spoken, the name of the poem is just If. Would you write that down? It's by Rudyard Kipling. A great poem. Some of you are familiar with it. The first line of the poem starts out saying this, If you keep your head while all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, and then it goes on to talk about what that means to stay calm in the midst of crisis, The very last line of that poem says this, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. Do you know how few people in the face of crisis have a divinely prescribed plan of calmness in which they interact with crisis? I want to give you this morning a few things found in this man, Joseph, that will help you persevere when you face crisis and specifically in the area of calmness of plan. Number one, first of all, we need to be calm in our evaluation. We need to be calm in our evaluation. Would you go back to earlier in chapter 41 of Genesis to verse 28? And we'll not delve into the great details of this chapter because we've already done that. I encourage you to read through this chapter later in your own. But notice just a couple of verses. First, verse 28. All right? Joseph has heard the dreams, and now he's beginning to interact with the dreams Pharaoh has received, and he's giving the interpretation. And notice what he says in verse 28. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. Notice the next two words. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. He goes on to talk about the seven good years, the seven bad years. Now, if you will, go to verse 32. And for that dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. How do we evaluate the crises that come into our life in a way that God can use. Number one, first of all, by being spiritual in our evaluation. Isn't it interesting that Pharaoh and everybody else in this room are assessing it from a political standpoint, an economic standpoint, even a family standpoint? And Joseph is the only one that assesses the crisis from God's perspective. You want to know how we finish? We start by looking at it through the lens of God's Word, through the lens of God's Spirit. How many of us, when we have a crisis come up, the first thing we process that situation with is our own minds, our own hearts, our own flesh, and it is less than spiritual in its evaluation. Here in this chapter, Joseph uh, sees that God is working. He sees that God precedes the famine. God will outlive the famine. God is over the famine. And you will notice in Joseph's mind, there's a sequence. There's God, there's the famine, and then there's still God. Is that how we process information, crises that come? I've heard a lot of people, it's just a bad economy, a bad economy, a bad economy. An illness, an illness, an illness. What about God? You fill in the blank of the crisis you're facing this morning or will face this week, and then end it with God. And if we can get that sequence in our mind and we can think from a spiritual perspective, we can persevere because we know who waits for us on the other side, and that is God himself. And so Joseph had a spiritual evaluation. Do you recite your woes and your ills more naturally than you do heaven's strength? Is that where you spend your time commiserating and talking about? Or do you assume God is in your crisis and God will end your crisis in a way that pleases and honors him? Number two, if you will, secondly, now do we need spiritual evaluation? Number two, we need specific evaluation. Specific evaluation. Notice how specific Joseph is in his analysis of the crisis. Look at verse 33 here in 41 of Genesis. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. And then he goes on to list specific instructions that he advises Pharaoh to follow. Now notice their response beginning in verse 37. 
And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? Um, have you ever been in a situation where someone tells a joke? Um, and the joke, I guess, is funny, but really what is funny is someone who overlaughs the joke. Have you ever had that? You know, someone tells a joke and then someone just starts snorting. If you ever, uh, it's amazing to me how many different types of laughs there are. But I can remember several times in my life where the joke was told, I can't even remember the joke. All I can remember is junior or so-and-so in my family, how they responded to the joke. They overreacted. When it comes to crisis, do we react with emotions or do we react with godly evaluation? Joseph was very calm, very collected, and that's only possible with the Lord's help. Now, you notice in verse 38, as we just read, what did they see when they looked at Joseph? A man filled with the Spirit of God. Here's the principle this morning. For us to persevere, we must have a spiritual evaluation and a specific evaluation, listen, so that not the flesh controls us, but the Spirit controls us. Who's going to help us get through the things we're facing this morning? If, not, if it's not the Spirit of God. It's not going to be your flesh. It's not going to be mine. The longer I go, the more I realize how flawed and how limited my abilities are. But when it comes to God, and specifically the power of God's Spirit, He can sustain us. But we must be calm in the face of crisis that our emotions and our valuation is controlled by the Spirit of God. I was reading the other day, for those of you that are businessmen and business ladies, this would maybe apply in your areas of influence about two management men that write a lot of things. Their names are Jim Collins and Morton Hansen. And they recently wrote a study they did of, of companies that are managed by people during crises that come into the, whether it's economy, whether it's a loss of uh, market share, whatever the case may be. And they were studying specifically why in crisis, the same crisis, some companies thrive and other companies just fall apart. They begin to fade and falter. And they concluded, quote, successful leaders are not more creative, they are not more visionary, they are not more charismatic, they are not more ambitious, they are not blessed with blind luck, they're not more heroic. They are, and here was their conclusion. Simply, they are people who led their teams with a surprising method of self-control in an out-of-control world. Are we submitted to the control of the Holy Spirit this morning? Is He what defines our responses and our evaluation of the crisis before us. And I would just encourage you this morning, do we, have, do we have crisis in our day? Yeah, would you say we're under moral crisis today? We're under spiritual crisis. The family is in crisis. What is to be our response to that? How do we persevere through that and not panic and not quit and not falter in our faith and relationship with God? I would submit to you two things. First of all, childlike trust in God. And secondly, number two, childlike obedience to God. I, I see in you, and sometimes I'm sure you pick it up in me, we, we see all that's going on and we want to do something and we want to uh, stem the tide and we want to push back against the crisis of our day. Can I encourage you, what we need to do is we need to calmly do what God has led us to do. Raise our families, do ministry, be salt and light. What else can we do besides quit? I want to encourage you today, the best thing we can do for this church and for our families and for the future of our country and our world is to trust God, spiritually evaluate the situation, say, you know what, God told me a long time ago, this is what I'm to do and be, and I'm going to do it today again and tomorrow again. If the heaven falls, I want to be found faithful to God. That's how we finish, by every day doing the little things, doing the faithful things so that God might bless and use that faithfulness as he did in the life of Joseph. Number two, how else are we to be calm as we observe in the life and example of Joseph? Number two, we must also be calm in administration. See, Joseph didn't just have to guide and channel his own heart. He also had to influence others that if he had not led, would have panicked, would have seen it as an insurmountable crisis of their day. Um, I don't know if you've had in your home some DIY projects that stands for do it yourself. If you don't even know what that stands for, you probably shouldn't be doing any projects yourself. I know what it means and I still shouldn't be probably doing most of what I try. I was sharing with our church a few weeks ago on a Wednesday um, 
we were doing a little bit of renovation to our home going in the spring, and one of the things that we did was we replaced a couple of doors in our home, and um, we put a door in our front door. My father-in-law helped me with that, and I decided, man, I got this thing figured out, and so I'm going to put this back door in by myself, um, and uh, then I finally realized at least I'll have him help me shove it in. So Sunday afternoon, we got done here, and real quick, we were just going to put it in, tack it, and later that week, I'd work on it, and we pick up the door, and... Uh, He's on one side, I'm on the other, pretty heavy door um, and exterior door, and we get it up to the, to the, to the hole and it, just, it doesn't fit. And I start going through my mind of all the reasons why it's not fitting, and none of them were, what was the real reason? First I thought there was a nail sticking out, then I thought you know, something on the surface of the rough opening, and finally I realized my father-in-law, he didn't say anything, I'll give him credit for that, he just let you know, the dumb son-in-law figure it out on his own that I had a 36-inch 36, 36 door trying to go into an old 32-inch opening. Didn't plan it out, didn't think it through. You ever had that moment? Calm administration. With Joseph, not only did he face the crisis with God, number two, he faced it with a plan. Going back to the DIY thing for a moment, I, I remember when we were in Michigan, some of you have heard this story before, there was a man, that good friend of, I think he'll still be a good friend after I share this, I won't give you his name, but he and his wife decided to replace a faucet in their bathroom. And not thinking ahead, they decided to change the faucet, here's the key, without turning the water off. And I, and I remember from the wife's story, her saying to her, her husband saying to her, as you know, Mr. DIY himself is getting ready to yank this faucet with full pressure behind it, as he turned to his wife and said, we might need a few towels. That, that was his assessment, his pre-planning. <laughs> And, I, and they did it. And I, I still, in my mind, I have this visual of just with this geyser, you know, coming out, out of their faucet, <laughs> throwing towels and blankets and everything you got, this dumb thing. Planning. Do you know often, listen to me, it is not the immediate and initial crisis that gets us in trouble. It's how we respond to it. A crisis does not mean panic. A crisis means turn to God and say, God, what do you want me to do? Give me a plan. Give me steps. Give me a sequence that will lead in the direction you want this to go. Now, notice in Joseph's life how this happened. Go to chapter, you're there in chapter uh, 41. Look now at verse 34. And notice how Joseph administers and leads in the midst of this crisis. And dads, I hope you'll pick up some things this morning. Ladies, where you lead, men, women, young people, here's how we lead. Look at verse 34. Let Pharaoh do this. And let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Verse 36, and that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine. And so Joseph faced it with a plan. How so? First of all, number one, with a succinct administration, he was concise if you take verse 34 through verse 36, you can basically fit it on a three by five card, can't you? No, no amazing, profound plan, just, just a couple of simple steps, all right? We've got plenty of years, let's save some, and then we have famine, and then we'll use what we've saved. Doesn't that almost seem a little too boring, too simple? That Joseph just had this simple plan and he simply administered it in a way that pleased the Lord? I find in our lives when we have a dramatic crisis, we think the only solution is more drama. We really think that when a big thing happens that we have to do some big thing. And I remind you, yes, sometimes God does that. You look at Paul and you look at Peter and you look at these amazing things God did. But for every Peter and Paul, there's a dozen Josephs. People that just day to day did what God led them to do. And that faithfulness and those simple steps led to deliverance and led to persevering. Joseph, all he did was formulate a plan and stick to it. Joseph never raised the dead, but he kept people from dying. He never healed the sick, but he kept sickness from spreading. And because he stuck to the plan, the nation survived. And all as a result of God blessing the plan he had given we don't have time to look at it, but in Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 9, it talks about Nehemiah, another example of planning. That in his life, he had all kinds of enemies surrounding as they're trying to rebuild the temple. 
And in chapter 4 and verse 9, it says this, after Nehemiah is aware of all these enemies and the crisis of his day, he says, nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. He prayed, but then he posted. He did his part. And I believe this, sticking with our analogy in our series here, though God can make us a prince, a leader that God can use to influence others, he's still the king. He's still in control. And he offers to us the opportunity to trust him and then do our part to please him. In in this building back in the kitchen area, I think it's still up. Last time I saw it has a, a sign. I don't know who posted it. I could guess who it was, but one of those that work and administer in this building. And it has a sign, and on it is the following quote. Poor planning on your part does not constitute an emergency on my part. Have you ever seen that sign? Thea, I think, re-stuck it up just recently. I'm just kidding. Uh, Poor planning on your part doesn't mean it's an emergency for me. You know, with God, listen to me, many of us have not done our part. And we're waiting on God to do something amazing. When God says, follow the plan I have for your home, follow the plan I have for your finances, follow the plan I have for ministry, follow the plan when it comes to membership and service and ministry and involvement, God wants us to follow his plan. May I encourage you today to trust God to do what you cannot and then obey God and do what you can. And I'm telling you, when you have that tension, those two elements, now you can persevere through the most dire situations. All right, number two. Look, if you will, now chapter 47 and verse 23. Genesis 47, if you would please, and verse 23. And there's a second aspect of how Joseph managed or administered this situation that all of us leaders this morning need to glean something from that can be a tremendous help. Look at verse 23, all right? This is now everything Joseph has said has come true with God's discernment. And now they're, they're reaching the, the climax of the famine. And we have time to read it, but in verse 13 and following, they start selling off everything they have to Joseph just to get food for their kids and food for their families. And finally, in verse 23, after they've given him everything they have, notice what it says in verse 23, Then Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day in your land for Pharaoh, or in exchange for the food that they received. Lo, here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. That, that's amazing to me. Joseph, listen, not only did he believe the plenteous years would come and the famine years would come, but listen, he started planning for the year after the seventh year of famine, and he was the one who directed the people to do that. I just find that profound. Notice verse 24, And it shall come to pass in the increase that you shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh, and four parts shall be your own. For the sea of the field, and for your food, and for them of your households, and for food for your little ones. And they said, notice now their response in the midst of great crisis. Thou hast saved our lives, let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. Number two, also we need steady. We need steady administration. By now in this story, if it had not been for Joseph, what would the people have been doing toward the government of Egypt? Not thanking it burning it to the ground, right? We've seen it, haven't we, in certain areas, Greece recently and other places where great financial stress, they turn to attack the government. And Joseph's calmness and Joseph's leadership passes off to those around him as they calmly respond and manage the crisis. And what concerns me today is not the young people in this building and what they think about the crises of our day. It's what they see in you what they see in me. Have you ever been in a family gathering and all the adults are talking about the, 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 the tragic things going on and the little ears and eyes and hearts are right underneath that conversation and they're having fall to them panic. They're having fall to them worry. Where's faith today in God? We're simple, step upon step, obedience to God's will. And when we are calm in the face of crisis with God's help, so can those that follow us. I was reading the other day uh, an article talking about that in the early days leading up to World War II in Germany, the British government commissioned a series of posters, and these were posters that uh, the idea was to capture encouraging slogans on paper, and they would slap them on different public buildings and locations, and people would see those. 
And, and basically all it was was the crest of the king and then just a quick snippet, something to basically keep going. You can, we can get through this war together. And they only posted two of those posters before Germany caved and the Allies won the war. We just had D-Day this past week, the 70th anniversary of that. But what was fascinating is just recently a person found the third poster in that series. It's been several years ago now, but several years after the war. And that third poster they had never used. But the person who found it was just in an old bookstore and he opened up some things and out fell an original poster that had been printed by the British government. And on that poster was the, the following statement. Keep was on the first line. Calm was on the second line, third line, and fourth line, carry on. Keep calm and carry on. And they suppose, from what they've been able to account, that if literally Great Britain was invaded by German troops, this was the last one they were going to put up. As they're overwhelmed with German troops, keep calm, carry on. I've seen that, haven't you? Have you seen that on coffee mugs or posters? I never knew the story behind it. Keep calm and carry on. Can I encourage you this morning? That's what we need to do. That's what we need to do. Keep on. And whatever you list that God has given us to do, let's keep doing it. Let's be faithful. Other generations have done that, have they not? And we benefit from that this morning. May God help us to keep calm and carry on. What should we do when it feels like the world is out of control? I would submit to you we need to possess fierce calmness as we go about our families and our local churches and our responsibilities before the Lord. Now, number two, if you will, go now to chapter 50 of Genesis and look at verse 20. And this is really the summary verse of our study. We began with this about two months ago, and we end with it this morning. There's a second commitment or response that we must have in the face of crisis if we are to persevere in the face of crisis. Look, if you will, Genesis 50 and verse 20. Joseph says this, but as for you, this is his brethren coming to him, concerned that he will exact revenge. And notice what he says, but as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people Alive. Number two, we must also possess a confident pattern. A confident pattern. Heidi and I, a few months ago, you may know this, I've shared this, I think, before. She likes to crochet and knit and that kind of thing, and I'll just sit from the other side of the living room and cheer her on, thinking I would never be interested in doing that. But I encourage her and I benefit from what she makes, and not that I think she's made me anything I've worn, but I'm just saying she's, it's, it's her niche and we enjoy that together. And we usually talk, or I watch sports while she does that. Um, probably more watching sports than talking to her, but anyway, just for the record. But the other day we ran into a lady. Uh, I can't remember the exact circumstances, but there was a lady who's also, Heidi loves to look at yarn, you know, just check out different skeins, I guess is the term, and different types. You can tell how much I'm into this. And so she'll, ch well, the other day she was talking to a lady who said, yeah, I also really like yarn. And I said, oh, so you knit or crochet? And she said, no. She said, but I buy it, and I take it home. And we just kind of, we, we still laugh about it, visualizing her trying to come up with things to do with yarn besides weave something with it. I don't know if she lets her cat play with it or, you know, uh, I don't know, wraps it around herself and does the mummy something. I don't know. I don't know what she does. <laughs> I have these mental pictures in my mind of what she does with that yarn. What, what, is, what is yarn meant for? It's meant to create a pattern, right? It's meant to weave together. Do you know that what we look at in our day is just, isn't it by itself just a jumbled mess? It is, isn't it? What's happened to you, the junk, the heartache, the sorrow, the things you've caused to other people, just the world at large, there's so much chaos. Remember, God is weaving something. There's a pattern. He's got a master plan, and it will culminate with what He has planned. In your life, in mine, in ours together, we will see it someday. And I will tell you, here is the pattern. And if I shared this with the men this morning, here's the pattern, all right? If you're taking notes, jot this down. Evil, God, good. That's the pattern. That's the sequence. Evil, God gets involved. Good is the result. Did you see that in the verse we just read? Evil, God, 
Good. Now let me give you a few things in relation to that pattern that I hope will help you in the days and weeks ahead. Number one, first of all, we need to be confident in the face of evil. We need to be confident in the face of evil. Notice Joseph acknowledges, ye thought evil against me. Now, real quick, if you would, go back to Genesis 41. Can I give you through the names of Manasseh and Ephraim, Joseph's two sons, his heart toward the evil that had happened? Would you look at Genesis 41, please? And specifically, look at verse 51 and verse 52. All right, so Joseph's been successful. Um, God has raised him to a place of position. He is now married. And notice the names that he gives to his two sons and the significance of those names. Verse 51, and Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, and now here's the meaning of that name, for God, said he, hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. Number one, first of all, God gives to us forgotten evil. Are you like me? It's not the initial pain that's the hardest part of difficulty. It's the lingering memories that you just can't let go of evil that's been done to you, evil that's happened to you, God will allow us to forget that someday. I I can't wait for that moment. When it says tears will be wiped from our eyes, it also means the raw, deeply embedded emotions connected to those tears will be gone. When I look at you, I don't know all of you, but I know in your lives as much hurt and evil that's been done to you or around you. Do you believe this morning that God will someday allow you to forget that? I look forward to that day for you. And for those I know that have experienced deep hurt, there's a forgetting that is coming. And here is Jacob now as he stands before his brethren in chapter uh, chapter 50 that we just read, and they're worried that Joseph has not forgotten. He was just waiting until his father passed away, and now he's going to get at his brethren. Now, you're there in chapter 41. Hold your place. And real quick, notice the previous verse to chapter 20 and chapter 50. Would you go back there? I apologize for jumping around, but to get it, the full picture this morning, I think we need to look at it. Look at the previous verse in Genesis 50 and verse 19. And there's a principle here I would draw to your attention. Look at verse 19. All right, so they come to him and they say, Joseph, are you going to wipe us off the face of the map? Are you going to take us out? Are you going to revenge us for what we've done to you? And notice the first words that he has. And Joseph said unto them, fear not, for am I in the place of What's the next word? God. Am I in the place of God? And here's the truth this morning I would give you. If you have an evil, something that's happened to you in your life, that, you know, to be honest, someone else made a mistake or they purposely hurt you, something hurtful has been in your past, may give you a truth that is helping me and has helped others in days gone by that I've experienced. The way to forget evil is to focus on the God of all good. The way to forget evil is to focus upon the God of all good. James chapter 1 and verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift cometh from above, from the Father of lights, in whom is no variableness or shadow of turning. He just keeps dispensing good, good, good. That's how the Corey Ten Booms of Christian Christian history can quit thinking about the concentration camps and write the eloquent language and books she wrote because her focus was upon God. And we could list many of them this morning. People who saw the God of all goodness in the face of a temptation to be bitter about what evil had happened. I was reading the other day of a girl who is from a remote village in Africa, and what was striking about her story was how God worked in her body and brought good out of evil. And basically through what had happened to her, she had lost not just physical things, but emotionally, as a young lady, she was very distressed. And here's what happened. She had a skin disease called Noma, N-O-M-A, literally eat her face apart. Ate her palate, ate her nose, ate her mouth, and they showed some pictures of her deformities. And obviously, as a young lady, there's more than just the physical implications of breathing and functioning and eating, but also just her appearance and socially how that impacted her. And the story was told of a group of doctors in uh, New York, Stony Brook, uh, New York, who heard of her story. And one of the doctors specifically traveled there, assessed the situation, and they flew her back to New York. And they did multiple surgeries on her, and they were showing pictures of how they've reconstructed her face and how she's functioning. 
But the name of the organization they started as a result of this young lady and how God worked in her life is called this, the Smile Rescue Fund for Kids. I like that title, Smile Rescue Fund. Do you know that it is possible to grin and bear it? We use that term, don't we? When we're focused on God. Man, God's going to do something here. Sometimes you're smiling through tears. You're smiling through a great heartache and value, but a valley, but you see Him. Who's the source of your smile and joy today? If it's God, you can persevere through the difficulty that's happened, is happening, will happen in your life. Where's your focus this morning? You can only persevere when your focus is upon Him. Secondly, notice the second name that he gave to his sons, first to Manasseh in chapter 41 and verse 51. Notice now verse 52. And the name of the second called he Ephraim. Notice this. For God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Number two, he also gives to us a faith that evil produces fruit. A fruitful evil. Can I ask you this morning, what if Joseph had given up on God? What if he had? In prison, in the pit, maybe in Potiphar's house, I don't know where. He would not have experienced these two boys, would he? He would not have experienced the fruit of of those seven plenteous years in the ministry and leadership God gave him. It was through evil that God brought good. I have a belief, and I have to practice this, but based upon the Word of God, I have a belief that there's nothing God can't touch and God can't change, and God can't conform to His plan and purpose. And that includes direct attacks against Him. I love the verse, God will cause even the wrath of men. To what? Please Him. God can take anything, your rubble and mine, your junkyard and mine, with all the things that are thrown in it, and God can rebirth that and reconform that to bring what is fruitful. And I mentioned this on the onset of our study God loves to bring us through things, doesn't He? Did you catch that in the last song we sang just a moment ago? Christ is able to bring us through. He didn't bring them hovering over the Red Sea. He brought them through the Red Sea. God brings us through stuff. God loves to use that word through and bring us through things so that He can also through that birth great fruit. Where's your confidence today? Where's your anticipation that God can take evil? Rearrange it. And bring about good. Now, lastly, if you will, look back in chapter 15, verse 20, the last two phrases found in this verse, and we'll be done today. So, first of all, we need to be confident in evil, that God is at work. Number two, notice he says, But as for you, ye thought evil against me. Notice Genesis 50, the middle of verse 20, but God meant it unto good. Number two, we must be confident in good. We must be confident in good. Someone the other day was joking and they said, uh, you know, why, why put cookie dough in the oven when you can put it in your mouth? How many of you like cookie dough? You like ice cream or cookie dough? Bunch of impatient people, you gotta have it right away. It, I don't know about you, I like, I like warm cookies, all right? cookie dough, you can have it, all right? If you're going to bake it for me, then I'll take it, you know, but I want the oven to interact with that substance. By the way, by the way, what is in cookie dough? Raw eggs. I just give that thought to you. You can think about that, what that means for you health-wise. Um, but anyway, there, there's a, it's, for me, my perspective, it's better when it's submitted to the heat of the oven. Do you know how often we really think if we just get what we want now, and we can just cut out on the pain and the sorrow and the suffering and the unknowns that that that's good enough. What I want to encourage this morning, don't settle for that. Allow your life to be refined. Allow it to be submitted to the the heat and the pressure and the the, the fears and concerns that come with it so that God can produce something great in your life. Be confident in the good that God has promised. And what God promises is not inferior good. It's not second-rate good. In fact, it'll blow your mind. It'll pop your eyes. It's amazing what God has promised us. 1 Corinthians 2 9. I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither have entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. That love him and love his purpose and his plan for our lives. God can take evil and bring great good. What kind of good? Notice there in verse 20, he says, God meant it unto good. First of all, number one, with intended good. With intended good. 
God does not say, oh boy, here's some evil, and let's, I guess, nah, let's just wing it. Let's just come up with something good to bring out of this. God is orchestrating our lives because He wants to bring good. He intends to do that. That's been His plan all along. Quickly, go back to chapter 45 and look, if you will, at verse 5. We touched on this last week, but I remind you that Joseph earlier reminded his brethren of what God intended. They intended evil, God intended good. Genesis 45, look at verse 5. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Verse 7 of Genesis 45, and God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. And here's the statement this morning that I would, if you're taking notes, I'd jot this down. Here it is. Anything that comes into God's hand that is intended evil, anything that's placed in God's hand that's intended evil, will, eventually, will become eventual good. Anything placed in God's hand that is intended to be evil, if we'll let Him have it and work it and use it, will become eventual good. Do you believe that today? Do I believe that today? Man, we ought to get excited. If we have so much evil in our lives and so much evil in our day, man, what could God do with this? What could God do with this situation if I would let Him have control? If I would let Him be sovereign in this scenario? Here is Joseph. He ties himself to this promise that God intends good through all the evil he had suffered. God redeemed the pain and redeemed the brokenness and brought things together that were humanly impossible. Job 23.10, Job who knew a thing or two about God taking evil and bringing good out of it, said this in the face of all his loss, he knoweth the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. The question I have for you this morning is this, do you resent the difficulty that's happened to you? I see more of that in our day as believers. We resent someone or something or some situation. Or do we rejoice? God, thank you. I look at Paul and Silas singing in the prison, and I don't know that I see any of us in this room that would have had that kind of mindset if that had been us. And yet, may I remind you, if we will rejoice in suffering, we may also rejoice in the good that God intends. Don't resent it. Celebrate what God is about to do. Now, lastly, look back at chapter 50 and verse 20, the last phrase. So God meant it unto good. And notice now the end of this verse. He says... What specifically is that good? To bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Number two, and lastly also, it is an including good. It is an including good. I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but if Joseph were after this leadership position to fill out a resume, he literally could have put on his resume, save the world from starvation. That's literally what God allowed him to accomplish. It wasn't just about Joseph. It wasn't just about his immediate family. There was much people, and that is a major understatement to say, much people that needed to be saved, and God chose to use this young man who persevered, and God used him. May I give you a quick verse of application in that as we wrap up our thoughts this morning? Would you go back to the book of Psalms? Go forward in your Bibles a little bit to the middle Psalm 126. And I want to broaden your view this morning about the fact that perseverance is not just so you get yours and your family gets what it wants and you live a healthy, wealthy, prosperous life and you get heaven and you get eternity. So much more than you involved in your narrative this morning. Psalm 126, if you would please, and look at verse number 1. Psalm 126 and verse 1. When the Lord turned again ca the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream, right? We don't have time to get in the context of this psalm, but as you can see, God had brought deliverance to His people. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue was sing singing. Notice now the end of verse 2. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad, turning in our captivity, Lord, as the streams in the south. Verse 5, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. 
He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. This morning uh, in our Bible fellowship, Brother Johnny was able to share his testimony. We've started doing that in our Bible fellowship, just kind of sharing how we came to where we're at and where we got saved. And um, it was just a joy to hear him share how God has led him and even some details I had not heard before. He and I do discipleship together and we've gotten to know each other pretty well. But just, it was amazing to hear how God has worked in his life. And there's one thing he said today, I haven't shared this with him yet. He was talking about that he was, I think I've shared with you before, that he was looking for a Baptist church. And uh, we were meeting at the time over at the Oak Hill building. And uh, he said he'd been driving around for a few weeks looking for a Baptist church. He just wanted something where there was some doctrine being taught and things and knew that that was at least the type of church that would do that. And finally, he just said this morning, he said, I drove by and looked at the building. He said, I felt like I was comfortable driving onto that property. And we were, our offices were in a house, a parsonage there in that building. And I still remember him knocking on the door. I think it was kind of rainy that day. There was no dramatic music playing, but he was at the door and he knocked and opened. And he said, um, is, is this the church? You know, he's trying to figure out what the two buildings, if that was us. And he said, I'm looking for a Baptist church because it's rigid, is what he said, you know, which I'm like, is that a good thing or a bad thing? As he said that to me, are you trying to offend me or compliment me or what? And so we talked for a few minutes. But I was struck by his, his reference to the building. And I will tell you, who, I don't know who was here last night, but we have late nights setting up. We've been doing this now several years. And I was thinking about how the things that we go through, and as he said that this morning, it struck me. How many folks even in this room this morning and that we've impacted a ministry, as a ministry, we would not, if we had a plush, comfortable building, we had all of our thing all together, not that we don't pray for that and strive for that, but who would we not have seen and met? I met Johnny because of where we were located, with all the perseverance it took to be in that building and manage that building, and we've been in this facility for a few years, and I've, in my office, many times led people to Christ, sitting across from them at that conference table. Do you realize how everything we go through, there's a reason for it? And the reason is not just you, and the reason is not just me. There is much people that need to see it be real in your life when everything hurts and aches and it's a difficult moment. May I encourage you this morning to see the bigger plan, the bigger purpose of what God, God can do when we persevere, it doesn't just benefit our little world, it benefits the world at large. People who think this is as good as it gets, but we persevere through it so that God might be glorified and they might be drawn closer to Him. In 1911, there was a gentleman named Ronald Amundsen who headed up the Norwegian uh, team that was going to get to the South Pole first, first time in human history. Also, his contemporary Robert Scott directed a team from England. So there were these two teams of men trying to get to the South Pole. Who was going to get there first and claim it for their country? Both teams, both expeditions faced identical challenges and terrain. Uh, they had the same technology, the same uh, resources at their disposal. And yet Amundsen and his team, the Norwegians, reached the South Pole 34 days ahead of Scott. And the question for the historians for us this morning is this, why did Amundsen and his team get there 34 days earlier than Scott? What was the difference? The difference between these two men were two simple words, planning and patterns. Amundsen was a tireless strategist. He had a clear strategy of traveling 15 to 20 miles a day. Good weather, 15 to 20 miles. Bad weather, 15 to 20 miles. No more, no less, always 15 to 20 miles. Scott, in contrast, was irregular. He pushed his team to exhaustion in good weather, and then he would stop and regroup during bad weather. The two men had, different, had very different philosophies and consequently two very different outcomes. Amundsen won the race without losing a man. Scott lost not only the race, but also he lost his life in the life of every one of his team members, all for want of a plan. I see in our day panic, and I see in our day a flippant, just kind of emotionally charged reaction to the things going on. I'm not saying they aren't crises. They are. But our response needs to be more of Joseph 
and less of Pharaoh, less of the people, less of the world, because we have God, we have that bedrock. See, in the end, it's not the flashy and flamboyant that survive, it is those with a steady hand, with sober minds, with grounded hearts. Yesterday, what's today? Sunday, I guess it had been Friday, I had the privilege of going to a uh, home-going service for Pastor Richard Folger, and I have his uh, program here. This is the man God used to uh, lead me to Christ. He preached a message on hell on a Wednesday night, scared me to death, and I had the privilege of going home and being saved through that testimony with my mother and my brother. And I was thinking on him as I looked at his casket draped in a flag. He served in the Korean conflict, and um, God used him in ministry for many years. And I was thinking about just how God uses a man. You know that when God looks at you, you're a Joseph too. This man was my Joseph. God used him to impact me as a young man. I'm grateful for the legacy he's left to me. But you're that for others. See, I don't know if you came into this series with kind of a self-absorbed focus. Maybe you didn't pick it up when we first began, but it was about you getting through. And you do need to get through. But can I tell you, I believe God's put us into difficult days so that the world will take note, so that our family members will notice there's a difference. If it's easy, it's just one of. But when we persevere through difficulty, God gets attention. God gets glory. Jesus Christ is exalted. And the question this morning, are you willing to be a Joseph, a courier of grace in a day of anger and revenge? Your descendants, your children, your grandchildren need a sturdy link back to others of faith. Your generation needs a Joseph. There's a famine. Are we willing to plant? Are we willing to prepare for the harvest that God has promised? One last verse and we'll finish. Would you go to Galatians 6? And I believe this verse is a verse many of us draw great comfort from, but I remind you of it this morning. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. And I hope you picked that truth up we read just a moment ago that, Dave, or that Joseph instructed people to plant before the famine was over. Here's a guy, he's gone through so much, you think he'd just sit on what he had. Why do we keep planting? Why do we keep pushing forward? Here's the truth. Galatians chapter 6. And let's begin in verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Now notice verse 9. Here's the application. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Here's my question for you this morning, and I mean this from a heart of love. Are you willing to persevere, number one, by maintaining a calm plan? What does God want me to do? What does He want me to be? I'm going to hold there until instructed otherwise. How in the world are we going to handle the problems of this world when our homes are not obedient to the Word of God or not submitted to the authority of the Holy Spirit? How are we going to manage an unlo- a lost world that doesn't know of Jesus Christ if He doesn't rule and reign in our hearts and lives? May we this morning see the bigger picture. And if we are not weary in well-doing, we will reap. If we faint not, are you willing to have a calm plan? And number two, are you willing to see the confident pattern? Evil, God, good. God, famine, God. If we position our lives and homes and ministries based upon the simple, basic, from the world's perspective, boring and mundane principles of God's Word, God will enable us to face the crises of our day, to be salt and light, to be a blessing and benefit to this world. Let's pray. Father, thank you today for your Word. Thank you for the joy it's been to study it.